Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with award-winning, longtime journalist and friend Denise Tessier to talk about the state of journalism in New Mexico. Denise um, is a, currently writing for uh, the much-read and very informative Albuquerque JournalWatch.com, funded by the nonprofit Center for Civic Policy. A, a good deal of our conversation today will focus on the Albuquerque Journal, a paper for which she worked for some 20 years. She's an historian, a lecturer, a magazine writer, an author, a reporter, and an editor, and she co-authored A History of New Mexico, Press Women from 1949 to 2009, and has posted on the New Mexico State Historian website a history of New Mexico County courthouses in all 33 counties. Denise is what I would consider a consummate pro, and we are delighted to have her here with us today in the New Mexico Mercury Library. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> so let me start out by asking you about the uh, mission statement of the Albuquerque Journal Watch. I'll quote, robust, honest, and frank media criticism is essential in a thriving democracy. Journal Watch is a forum designed to critically examine the journalistic practices of the Albuquerque Journal, New Mexico's largest daily newspaper. With that in mind, um, what is the impact on a city like ours of having only one daily newspaper and having that one be almost belligerently conservative? My purpose at ABQ Journal Watch is not to bash the journal or even to see the journal go away. And some people are surprised to hear that. Um, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, newspapers are vitally important and even though the journal is a conservative newspaper, um, no other media organization has the resources and the infrastructure that the journal has. Um, and whatever your view of the paper's editorial positions, they have some excellent writers. I wish, if they haven't already, that the journal would submit Win Quigley stuff to the Pulitzer Committee. Um, but just imagine if we in the Albuquerque area did not have the journal and did not have these reporters covering the drought and Washington, D.C. and state and local government and the courts. Um, we, as a community, need a local newspaper and the journal is our local newspaper. <laughs> like it or not. So <laughs> while it would certainly be nice to have two daily newspapers and robust competition between the two, like we had in the days when we had both the Journal and the Tribune. We, we don't want the Journal to go away, um, but even though they've been battered in some ways by the internet and so on, and struggling and had to make changes and have lost staff, um, what we're trying to do at, at Journal Watch is kind of hold them to a higher standard because they're the only one Good. that's left. Good. And call them on it when uh, opinion gets mixed in with a news story or uh, a story doesn't get the play it deserves or gets more play than it deserves or has a misleading headline. Now, the journal editorially has been consistently against the Affordable Care Act right. in its editorials. And that spilled over, I think, into even headlines. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm going to refer to this one. Um, Wednesday, is that yesterday? Yeah, yesterday yeah. <laughs> the headline is Tough Sell for Healthcare. And the subhead is Native Americans may not embrace special benefits Obamacare offers them. What this story is, story is saying is that Indian health advocates say the benefits of the Affordable Health Care Act are many for Native Americans. So uh, the headline could have been, Obamacare has special benefits for Native Americans, but it's tough sell for health care. <laughs> so <laughs> so there, there's an example. You know, a long time ago, you know, a lot of us worried when, when the Tribune folded that the same thing might indeed happen to the journal. And we wondered, um, and that's... I've written about it a number of times, about what would a, a town do without a core 
of reporters without possibly dozens and dozens of reporters looking around. And I think it would be a total disaster, too. And um, I think uh, when the Tribune went away, we lost a whole a whole cadre of people who knew what was happening in the world. And, and I, I certainly don't want to see the journal uh, go away either uh, because I read it. God help me, every day cover to cover, and we clip it. And and um, but, um, what do you think um, in the long run? I guess, I guess I want to frame it this way: Why did you start a BQ Journal Watch in the first place? Was it to hold the journal to a higher standard? Well, I didn't start it oh, personally. Okay. okay. Um, it was started by the Center for Civic right, Policy, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. and the first person who. Uh, was writing, well, I guess we started writing at the same time, it was Tracy Dingman, who also worked oh, at the right. journal. Okay. And I think the point was to provide a, a balance, because the Tribune wasn't there. You know, the, the journal and the Trib editorially, you could almost predict what they were going to, uh, what position they were going to take, especially with uh, endorsements. Yes. You could expect the Tribune to endorse the Democrat, and the journal, the Republican. Although there were exceptions, of course, when um, Scripps Howard issued the edict that all Scripps Howard papers endorsed Bush. I mean, right. that was a surprise to both readers and the Trib staff. certainly was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, because the journal is all that's left, um, this is a way to educate readers about how to read the journal, what to look for. Okay. Um, I think we try to tell them uh, who's behind those articles on the op-ed page, the opposite editorial page. You know, who's being paid to write these things. Okay. And at ABQ Journal Watch, we don't have the resources to go out and cover stories, mm -hmm. but um, we like to point out when the journal misses a story, like the... Um, our state and federal legislators who might be under the influence of the American Legislative Executive Committee, so the ALEC, ALEC. Uh, we haven't had the stories about which legislators are, you know, bring, introducing into our state legislature ideas and policies that are emanating from think to out of state think tanks or billionaires. And this is something I think the journal should be aggressively covering. So the Alec story is really one of the most important, I think, in New Mexico and all around the country. In fact, uh, the New Mexico Mercury posted one of your great pieces about Alec. Um, this whole idea of being colonized by, intellectually colonized by outside, outside forces. Um, the, the actual um, ownership and, and, um, and and control of which uh, hardly anyone knows anything about. We s see this kind of slant now sort of permeating all kinds of news agencies. And the one I think that troubles me the most is the AP. Uh, it's become hard, hard to believe them. You know, I've noticed this too. Some, you, uh, some of this slant cannot all be blamed on the journal. They are running the AP. and. Right. For years, the AP has had the reputation, and I think it still does, as being a solid news organization. Yeah. But a lot of the stories coming out of Washington, they are written like an analysis. I don't know if they're trying to you know, make it more interesting, but um, if I can think of an example, there's one that uh, where on the front page it was something about quoting President Obama. And instead of saying President Obama today said X, it said in a move that could jeopardize his chances for re-election in <laughs> in twenty whatever year, and, and and then it had his quote, and you read the whole the rest of the story, and and there was no allusion to the election or anything. It's just something the reporter stuck in there or someone put in there. Yeah. And the journal runs these things, and and I see them with a lot of frequency. And sometimes we'll write about it on Journal Watch and say they should have put analysis next to that piece. Right. And this is one of the um, 
Well, the number one, I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but years ago, the uh, international paper company got Walter Cronkite to write an essay, and the idea was to increase newspaper readership, and he's a TV guy, but yeah. he wrote this essay about why you shouldn't just watch TV, but you should read the newspaper for the full story, that the TV is just the headlines, and you need yeah. to read newspapers, and the cardinal number one rule of journalism in his story, and in what we all learned, was that you don't mix news and opinion. Yeah that you try to segregate opinion, put it on the op-ed page or the editorial page, um, and that you don't put slant or uh, bias in the news story. And, and some took this to the extreme to where you wouldn't even have color in the story, no adjectives, you know, right. straight, just the facts. <laughs> but in getting away from that, what can be boring narrative, uh, this slant has jumped in there, and, and it's hard to keep it out, I suppose. I think the reporters at the Journal do tend to keep it out, and where you see it is in the wire stories and in the headlines and in placement. Those are all very important And in even And my colleague at Journal Watch, Arthur Alpert, he's always pointing out what's been cut. And sometimes I catch that too, where if you read it online, get the full version, did they just cut it from the bottom or did they cut out certain paragraphs? Mm -hmm. really and sure. that can slant that sure the can. story. It sure can. So, you know, one of the reasons why, uh, why so many of us read ABQ Journal Watch is that uh, we're concerned about the profession. You know, everybody who, who works in this world, you know, mm -hmm. wants it to be the best it can be. Uh, when we're assaulted with things like Huffington Post headlines, which are the most egregious and misleading of all things, I think, uh, you know, we see them. You know, we see that kind of thing, even if it's, you know, if it's a kind of a, you know, a dim version of it. You know, it, it rankles us. I can remember in the old days at the Tribune when somebody would write what I used to call Pearl Harbor-sized headlines, which said golf fees raised, you know, or winter storm seen, you know, I mean, they really, come on guys, you know, I mean, it was, there's always a, a problem with, um, with uh, degrading uh, uh, the profession, you know, and, and that's why I'm, I'm such an avid reader of ABQ Journal Watch, because you're so concerned with how to do it properly, and, and I think, I think there is a way to do it properly, and I think you do it. And um, and you know and you know I think I think the reporters the people who are working on the line are working really hard to get it right, but it's the bosses and you know and other things and we all know what kind of pressures everybody works under on the daily. But um, you also kind of see a strange uh, hierarchy problem with hierarchy. In the old days, uh, you couldn't really become a columnist until you'd worked endlessly uh, on the repertorial side. Could you talk a little bit about how things have changed over the years? You're right that in the old days you had to work your way up to becoming a columnist and you worked as a reporter and you learned the code of ethics, how to um, approach a story and be fair in terms of the information you gather and how it's presented. And there are, you know, the journal's always been had quite a few conservative columnists, and when the Tribune folded, it picked up George Will, the uh, Trib's rare conservative columnist, so it added to its its stable there. But some of those columnists, they, they didn't rise through the ranks. They worked in think tanks and just started writing and having their pieces disseminated from the get-go. I think Cal Thomas is one of these. Uh, a newer one who's come out, um, Jonah Goldberg. Right. And um, Cal Thomas, for example, consistently has referred to our public, our public schools as government schools and has railed against public education in favor of, you know, vouchers or religious education or private business running schools. And I think that's, he's, he can be partly blamed for the the sentiment we have right now against public education. Right. You know, they have great power. 
And I tend to uh, gravitate and trust more of the ones who were journalists and uh, worked to, um, to be fair and not have, you know, journalists, I don't think they have an agenda. The reporters, they're writing, they do not intend to misinform. They are trying to uh, record history and relate events that are happening. And if they inform the citizenry, I, I think that's their, the good thing that comes out of it. That's right. essential to a democracy is for us to be informed. But in today's world, you have websites that deliberately misinform, and I think you have columnists that deliberately misinform. And it's really hard with uh, the cutbacks newspapers have had. You know, the journal is still here, but it does not have the number of reporters it used to have. It's hard enough to cover what's out there, and there's a smaller news hole, too, without them having to also correct all the misinformation that's out there. Oh, boy. And so um, I don't uh, blame, uh, what's the word? I don't hold it against the newspapers for not discrediting everything, but I do think it's egregious when they perpetuate the misconceptions and you you have people writing letters to the editor or columns that have fa factual misinformation in them and yet they are printed some of these things need to go in the trash they are they should not be run because they are making it worse by perpetuating the misinformation so Walter Cronkite was trying to was trying to help us sort of um, observe um, and analyze what was real news and what was uh, silly news. In the old days, we kind of knew, uh, but it's hard to know. You're right, in the old days, or maybe we still have uh, the National Enquirer and uh, the Star, these things at the grocery checkout line, yeah. and people knew they were fake. But now you have all these websites that are fake, and uh, how do you navigate that? How do you know what's real and what's not? And that's another reason newspapers are so important. When I'm trying to link to back up something I've written on ABQ Journal Watch, I usually gravitate toward a newspaper as uh, the citation for the article because you know their reporters have been trained in, in journalism right. and have this you know, kind of code of ethics. And if, if they make a mistake, they'll correct it. You know, but uh, some of these sites, like I say, they they intend to misinform. They have an agenda. Well, in order to be an informed citizen, we uh, we really have to avail ourselves of all possible uh, sources of information. And I think, again, uh, uh, your reference uh, to Walter Cronkite is is so apropos because you have to be able to weed out what you think is real and what you think is false and it's always the job of the citizen and the reader to say who is credible, who is believable, and who is not. And usually the best way to do that, I think, is to read around a whole lot. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, another thing we try to do at ABQ Journal Watch, or I try to do, is alert people to the other media that's out there. Um, your publication, New Mexico Mercury, uh, New Mexico In Depth, uh, New Mexico Compass, and even the Weekly Alibi, which is still in print, yeah. uh, all tend to cover things that the journal has missed or has glossed over, or they might give a different take than the journal might have had a corporate friendly slant to this story. Um, and all of these publications deliver information via journalism. Yes. So they are inherently more trustworthy than uh, just a website you might find. And But the thing is, uh, these people, like yourself, you have great talent um, and... Uh, Intentions, but you don't have offices or a photo department or, uh, or a, budget. a fleet of vehicles <laughs> or, yes, a budget. And we're just scrambling for scarce resources. But it's important. So that's why we still have to read the journal uh, in order to be informed citizens of our community. And in Albuquerque, 
um, if your interests extend to the state or politics, I suggest I you should also read also read the Santa Fe New Mexican. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. you know, Steve Terrell is a real digger. He's great. And um, well, here's an example. Yesterday's there was. Now I'm not going to have the day right, but either yesterday or today, there was a story about Governor Susana Martinez raising more money than Gary King, her challenger, in the election. And the journal had it inside, and it based the headline was just that she raised more, and it had the numbers in the first paragraph. But the Santa Fe New Mexicans headline, and it was yesterday, had it. They did a little bit of math for the reader, and they had it right in the headline that the governor has raised more than 20 to 1 what what Gary King has raised and i think that that's a important implication that those who read the journal story you know might not have even gotten yeah. from from yeah. the way it was played and and they do they Terrell's been covering the Alec connection and yeah, and yeah. the journalists just touched on it just barely. So, you know, it's one thing for a legislator to be a ventriloquist's dummy for uh, Alec. <laughs> it's quite another thing to, uh, to, uh, to weed out where the script is coming from. But I think, like, as you've been saying, and I, and I think you're dead right, you know, the more, the more sources we get, uh, uh, the better. And uh, and this is particularly true for all of us to avail ourselves of local newspapers. I mean, we can. We run on on um, on the Mercury through uh, the curation of our publisher, Benito Aragon, uh, sites uh, from all over the state. And RSS feeds from all kinds of places. So we're trying to make sure that everybody gets a, you know, a, a, a more... Uh, Urban-rural balance, I guess one, one might say. And there's a lot of good reporting going on still. So I know you're a big advocate of, of, of local journalism, of small papers. Uh, could we sort of talk about that a little bit more? Because I think it's really important. You're right. It is really important. I think community newspapers are the future of journalism. Yeah. I mean, um, for local businesses, where else are they going to advertise but in their local community paper and who else is going to cover this local community news and this is an interesting thing that's evolved with the journal they've made some significant changes oh, yeah. in the internet age uh, there was a time when you didn't even mention it, another paper in, a, in an article I remember <laughs> writing an editorial and praising the Las Cruces Sun News and it was it was cut out to just be generic not mention the name but that's because the journal was competing with those papers. Yeah. They had correspondence in almost every town. And mm. now they don't have those correspondence. And they're actually relying on other newspapers. Uh, they've got their sister publications, the Mountain View Telegraph, the Socorro Defensor Chieftain, and the Valencia County News Bulletin. But I've also seen stories in the journal from the Carlsbad Current Argus and the Farmington Daily Times. You wouldn't have seen this before. Uh, the, the, I want to mention one, uh, Carlsbad Stella Davis. Her article was about farmers selling their water rights mm -hmm. to the oil industry for fracking. This is a real important story. Yeah, and, and the journal ran it because she had written it, I, I'm guessing. I'm fortunate, and uh, in, I live east of Albuquerque, and our community is served by two community papers, the Mountain View Telegraph and the Independent, based in Edgewood. Right. And I deliberately use the word serve because we are served by these publications. They cover things no other publication is going to cover. And so uh, just as the New York Times uses New Mexico papers to get the biggest stories that come out of our state, you know, the journal is using the uh, smaller papers as extended staff. And also another change, um, and this happened before I even left in, in 2005, they partnered with KOAT Channel 7. And uh, they'll give KOAT a story, uh, 
Seven will promo it on a Thursday night saying, here's the headline, read tomorrow's journal to get the rest. And so they're helping each other. These are, these are new things. So this has really been wonderful to be able to talk about a profession that we both hold dear to our hearts. Um, and I, I really have always been of the opinion that uh, citizens really need to pay attention to not only the news they're getting, but how how the news they're getting is produced and all the rest. And I, I'm, um, uh, I'm a really a firm believer of the kind of uh, training that uh, one gets as an apprentice. Uh, being sort of thrown into a newsroom and, uh, you know, and, and suddenly having to write about things that wasn't ever even heard of before, like, you know, crime. And small, small papers, uh, am I right? They serve as, as wonderful laboratories for reportorial talent. And I'm thinking right now of, of, of Bob Trapp and the, and, the, uh, and the Rio Grande Sun. You probably saw that. Show that was on PBS, a documentary about the Rio Grande Sun, and it's just wonderful how people are still on the streets selling the paper. They sell out every single day. People, it's local news, it's community oriented, and yes, uh, they have high turnover on their reporters. But I think it is a, it seems to me a great place to learn, and that seems to be true at at these smaller papers where you end up doing every job. You're laying out pages and taking the photo while you're out on the story and you're covering the high school games and the courthouse. You're doing it all. And this is where young people, this is another thing that's encouraging to me, that there is hope for the future of journalism because young people are going into the profession. They're majoring in journalism and they're going to work at these suburban papers or small town papers and and uh, carrying carrying on the legacy of informing their fellow citizens so they can be active informed members of of democracy you know to make it work you know at at journal watch i think we're trying to impart that the reader is part of the process oh, and uh in that same article uh Cronkite had he said that Edward R. Murrow had a plaque hanging on his wall with a quotation that said, it takes two to speak the truth, one to speak and one to hear. So it's not just up to the journal to be better. We as citizens need to learn to be better listeners and readers. And I guess that's the lesson we're trying to impart. Boy, I think you're so right. <laughs> this has been just a... Wonderful conversation. I think, you know, to actually talk about this business in, in public, you know, it's really, it's thrilling. And I've really enjoyed it. And thank you so much. And I know our viewers will too. Thank you very much, Barrett, for having me here today.